Yeah, I'm Gavin Langlands, Neurology Registrar in Glasgow, and today I'd like to talk about Parry Romberg syndrome. So this is also known as progressive hemifacial atrophy, which nicely describes what, what you see in these patients, where you get progressive atrophy of facial soft tissue predominantly, and this can sometimes extend deeper into muscle, bone and cartilage. Age of onset tends to be a bit younger, often around age 13 or 14, but it's a progressive condition and can progress for around up to 20 years. Females are more commonly affected than men, and it's a rare condition, but it's one that you may see in your neurology clinics for some of the complications that occur, and I'll come on to these. First described in 1825 and subsequently in 1846, and that's where it gets its name, Parry Romberg syndrome. Now, despite being around for that length of time, we still don't really understand what, what the pathogenesis is. There are a number of theories, and I'll talk about some of these as we move through. But probably the most commonly debated theory is, is this, this actually all just part of the spectrum of linear scleroderma? And I'll mention this. So you can see in the images taken from the reference, marked atrophy of the gentleman's left side of his face that affects forehead, maxillary area and the mandibular region. You can see it affects the eye. It also affects the tongue with its atrophy of one side of the tongue and also deviates on certain bony structures there. And that's a quite a severe case there. So what are the clinical manifestations? Well, they might present to your headache clinics. So patients can quite often get migraine and they can also get trigeminal neuralgia-like pain, believed to be because of their, their underlying structures have become deformed and might irritate the trigeminal nerve. They might present to your epilepsy clinics and they can get really quite troublesome focal seizures that are difficult to treat. They can affect a number of your cranial nerves, affect the facial sensation and the motor power to the left side, the one side of the face, but there's also extraocular involvement that's reported. So it can affect your vision. It can also affect your speech with a dysphonia largely because of this of alteration in the underlying structures. And I guess not forgetting that the most troublesome symptom to patients is the marked psychological impact. Now, investigations, there's not a sort of clear set of investigations you would do here. There's not been a sort of consistently linked infection or antibody really, but you often see changes in MRI brain imaging, particularly having had the condition for many years in some cases. Now, the changes you might see would be on T2, and you can get white matter, subcortical hyperintensities, sometimes atrophy, sometimes calcification. And usually the brain imaging findings are ipsilateral to the clinically affected site. You can see from the images from the reference, the lady in the image is in her early 60s and she's had the condition for many decades and has quite marked T2 subcortical white matter hyperintensities on the, in the axial images there but that would be a more severe case, and it can be more subtle than this. So what are the differentials to think about? Well, I think top of the list, and is it actually all part of the same disease spectrum, is linear scleroderma, or linear morphia, or linear morphia oncou de sabra, all really referring to the same sort of condition. The, the oncou de sabra referencing the, through the stroke of a sword, which really describes the linear marked delineation that you can see in patients' foreheads that separates atrophic tissue and normal tissue. Now, there are overlapping clinical and pathological features in linear scleroderma and Parry romberg syndrome, but probably the few distinguishing features that you might see would be in linear scleroderma, you tend to just get involvement of the forehead and the scalp rather than the whole side of the face. And also in linear scleroderma, you tend to get thickened, injurated skin which isn't really seen in progressive hemofacial atrophy. And you're less commonly going to get mucosal involvement or ocular involvement in linear scleroderma. You might also think about a few other things, so Rasmussen's encephalitis, a rare condition where you get progressive cortical atrophy in one cerebral hemisphere, often with troublesome seizures, but less commonly get the phenotype in these patients. And you might also think about partial lipodystrophies, or a congenital, a congenital problem that might affect the underlying bony structures from birth. What are the management options? Often these are cosmetic and surgical, and sadly, because it's a progressive condition, often patients need repeated surgical procedures. Not forgetting the psychological support that they need, 
managing other complications such as pain relief for headaches or anti-seizure medications for epilepsy. And the etiology remains unclear, but probably the most commonly used medication in some cases are those medications that are used also in linear scleroderma. So high-dose corticosteroids, daily high-dose PRED or pulsed IV methyl PRED, in addition to a steroid speeding agent, usually methotrexate, and then over time that is reported in some cases to believe to stop the progression. But given the etiology remains unclear, I think there still remains debate in the best management. Thanks very much.